It's just before 10 o'clock on the night of December 19, 2011. In a house near Bryan, Texas, the gentle patter of light rain is suddenly interrupted by a sound like an explosion, loud and violent, but not like thunder. Outside, in what has now become a deluge, the source of the noise soon becomes apparent. A short distance away, strung out and shattered into a dozen pieces, lie the barely recognizable remains of a light aircraft, its five occupants beyond help. Soon, emergency responders are on site, documenting the scene, doing what has to be done. There's one simple question on everyone's mind. What went wrong? The story that ends in that dark, rain-drenched farmyard begins nine hours earlier and four states away in Hampton, Georgia, where a pilot is pre-flighting his Piper Cherokee 6. He'll be joined on today's flight by his wife, brother, and two young children. Their destination is Waco, Texas. 33 years old, the private pilot has just shy of 400 hours total time, nearly all of it in this airplane, November 3590 Tango. He's held an instrument rating for just over two years and has logged a total of 14 hours in actual IMC. By the standards of most pilots, he flies quite a bit, 46 hours in the past three months. Shortly before 2 p.m. Eastern time, pilot and passengers head west on an IFR flight plan. Everything is routine. After a planned fuel stop in Jackson, Mississippi, they depart again just before 6 p.m. Central. Now, progress is slow. Strong winds aloft out of the southwest push ground speeds into double digits, and weather looms ahead. A strong north-south line of thunderstorms between the aircraft and its destination. At 8.20 p.m., the pilot is handed off to Houston Center and discusses his plans with the controller. Houston Center, good evening. You got November 35900 Tango with you level at 8,000. The 35900 Tango, Houston Center, Roger Love Canal, Timber 2988. I hesitate to talk too much about the weather, your speed, it could change all the other time you get there. But as of the current moment, the worst of the weather you have to face, I believe, is in a line from about 30 miles due west of College Station up to the north as far as I can see. All right, yes, sir. Uh, we're watching on the next rad, so uh, we're just going to play it by ear. On the evening of the accident, a low-pressure area centered over the Texas Panhandle dominated the regional weather map. This, in combination with other factors, including a stationary front, a warm, moist air mass, and significant atmospheric instability, created strong potential for convective activity over central and eastern Texas. By mid-evening, potential had become reality. By the time the pilot crossed into Texas, a long line of storms was slicing northeastward toward him at upwards of 45 knots. Two convective segments had already been issued by that point, the first at 7.55 p.m., the second one hour later. Both warned of a fast-moving line with severe embedded thunderstorms and tops above 45,000 feet. The pilot was notified of the second segment by Houston Center. It's not clear what the pilot knew about the weather prior to the flight. He did, however, have a Garmin 696 GPS receiver and an XM satellite weather subscription, which allowed him to overlay Nexrad radar on a moving map and access a variety of other weather information. Whatever his earlier knowledge, though, it's clear that by 9 p.m. the pilot was well aware of the line of precipitation between him and his destination. What's less clear is whether he grasped the true level of danger it represented. Given the outcome of the flight, the following discussion during a shift change at Houston Center has an ominous tone. I had a little talk with this fellow. His route goes right to Leona and goes hard back up. And he pretty much shook me off on anything I wanted to do. He said he'd rather just play it by ear. Okay. In, in his defense, he's really slow and it is moving north. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you may want to talk to him. It's now 9.19 p.m. Central Time, and the pilot has just been handed off to Houston Tracon. Normally, he wouldn't be this far south, but he's diverted significantly off course to avoid the weather. Now, he seems eager to turn back toward his destination. Approach, 
Chris, good evening. You got the number 3590 Tango with you, level 8000. Number 3590 Tango, Houston Approach. It looks like your present heading's uh, good for about uh, 40 miles and you should be able to make a right turn toward uh, TSTC. Okay, uh, yeah, what I was looking at on my next red is once I hit uh, Leona's, maybe taking about a 250 heading for a little while. That'd be all right. Yeah, I don't know. That 250 will put you in some moderate to heavy precip uh, for what I'm showing right now. Okay, we'll hold this heading. Yeah, you're looking good right now until about 20 miles north of college, and you can start bending it to the right. There's some pretty good gaps in the weather once you get around that area. Okay, roger that. Twelve minutes later, the controller's radar shows the aircraft edging closer to the weather. We're down zero tango. From what I'm showing, uh, you're skirting uh, right along the edge of a uh, light to moderate precipitation area. Yeah, I'm seeing the same thing. I'm just trying to uh, move south down and find a hole to go through without getting too much farther away from the airport. All right, here. Over 90 Tango, I do have a uh, heavy to extreme cell at your 1 to 2 o'clock and about 8 miles. Um, looks like once you get on the back side of that, uh, you can make a right turn toward uh, TSTC. Roger, I'm sorry, you would just hold this heading right here until we get south of that. That uh, works for me. Another five minutes go by, and the aircraft is now very close to the area of heavy precip the controller mentioned earlier. Uh, now, Zero Tango, are you getting any uh, lightning off the, off the right there? No, I haven't been seeing any, but I'm going to be uh, going left about 15 degrees here for just about two or three minutes. Definitely, that's fine. Uh, as you're able, you can turn uh, right direct to uh, TSTC. Okay, I'm showing a uh, pretty good storm here to my right that we're about to be passing. I'm going to turn right after that. Okay, that's what I'm showing. Five minutes later, the controller is advising the pilot that more weather may be moving into the Waco area when he notices something odd on his radar scope. Over 35 down to Tango, Houston. Yeah, go ahead, Houston. Yeah, it looks like you made a left 360 on me. What's going on? And over 90 Tango, I show you headed right into the heavy weather now. Uh, I would suggest you turn back right to about a 220 heading. By the time the pilot had gotten within close proximity to a fast-moving area of heavy precip, he was already in danger. But exactly how much danger depended on just how close. Around severe weather, relatively minor changes in location can mean major differences in flight conditions, which is one of the reasons why light aircraft in particular should stay well away from such weather. In this case, it was close proximity to the storm that brought a small but important detail into play. The data link radar display the pilot was using does not provide a real-time picture of the weather. It typically takes several minutes for the next rad ground station to complete the scans necessary to build an image, and added to that is the minute or so it takes to transmit the image to the aircraft. The total time lag that night varied between 6 and 8 minutes, a long time around storms moving at 45 knots. It's not clear what understanding the pilot had of this. But even if he knew about the possibility of significant time lag, there was another potentially confusing factor. The age indicator on his display would have initially shown the time it took for the image to be transmitted to the aircraft, not the total time to create the image. In other words, while the pilot was seeing the weather as it existed roughly eight minutes earlier, the display was telling him that the data was only one minute old. Here's what that difference meant in reality. In these images, we see where the aircraft actually was in relation to the weather. And in these, we see where the pilot likely thought it was. Zero Tango, I show you headed right into the heavy weather now. Uh, I would suggest you turn back right to about a 220 heading. It's now 9.42 p.m., and the pilot, fighting to maintain control of the aircraft, tersely acknowledges the controller's warning. They are the last words anyone will hear from November 3590 Tango. Okay, yeah, we're turning right. We're in some bad weather here. I'm going to try to get out of it. All the controller can do is watch as the aircraft completes an abrupt 180-degree right turn and starts to descend. When radar contact is lost, it's headed northwest, 
passing through 6,800 feet, airspeed building rapidly. In the seconds that follow, the wing spar snaps, the left wing separates from the fuselage, and gravity takes control. There's nothing new about thunderstorm-related accidents. For as long as people have been flying, they've been straying into convective activity and sometimes paying a heavy price for it. What is new, for most of us, is in-cockpit weather. NEXRAD radar images, transmitted via data link, provide a vastly better picture of the weather than we had in the past, in some respects even better than onboard radar. Useful as it is, though, the technology has limitations. Time delay being perhaps the most significant. In benign weather, it's rarely a problem. But around a storm that may be covering six or more miles during the delay period, it can mean the difference between life and death. That, in the starkest possible terms, is why it's a bad idea to use data link radar to pick your way through severe weather, especially in low visibility conditions. But there's a larger issue as well. Even if the pilot had been as far from the storm as he believed, he may not have been safe. Radar shows precipitation, but in a thunderstorm, it's the turbulence that's really dangerous. There is a correlation between the two, but aircraft destroying turbulence can, and often does, exist outside of heavy rain. It's also worth considering the role that factors like fatigue and hypoxia may have played. There's no way to be certain, but after almost nine hours at relatively high altitude, it seems likely that the pilot's judgment was impaired to at least some degree. In short, there are several lessons for pilots here. Awareness of data link time lag is important, but more critical is a healthy respect for the sheer power of severe weather. If a system is moving faster than 15 or 20 knots, if it has tops over 30,000 feet, if a convective sigmet has been issued, don't get close enough to make time lag a factor. Steer around the whole area or land and wait it out. The latter option was open to the pilot of 3590 Tango until just minutes before the final plunge. He could have turned 90 degrees to the weather and headed for safety. It would have meant a late arrival, but at least they would have arrived.